Okay, I'm on. All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Nelson Martel. I'm part of the steering committee for Ward 6. We're here at the Ward 6 MPA for December, last meeting of the year. Okay. Um, joined by fellow uh, steering committee members Michelle Braz, Matt Grady, and I'm not sure, but Joel Fitzgerald may be joining us remotely. Um, so, uh, a relatively brief agenda tonight, but a, a good one. Um, I'm going to start with public forum. Um, we have a, actually a message here that I'm going to read from our Ward 6 representative to the Ad Hoc Committee on Redistricting, uh, which is an ongoing process that if you're following us, you'll be aware of. Um, uh, it's from Rama Kocha Lakota, um, and I'm just going to read it here for a second, then we'll open it up to other comments. Uh, there will be a third and final open meeting where the public can give input on redistricting for the city council and the school board on December 6th between 6 and 8 p.m. at the Miller Center on Lakeside Avenue uh, across from the Public Works Building. Um, it will also be accessible via Zoom. Uh, the Zoom information uh, as well as contact info, uh, if you prefer to give your input via email, will be included in an upcoming front porch forum. So keep uh, your eyes peeled for that. Um, and with that, I guess we'll open it up to um, any public comments. I'm going to rely on Michelle and Matt to, to let me know if there are any. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> So if there are <laughs> public comments, we can get back to that at the end of the meeting. Um, for now, I think we'll move on to the first agenda uh, topic here, which is um, about Burlington High School, um, kind of where we're at currently um, and where we're headed. Uh, we're joined tonight by uh, Claire Wool, um, uh, Burlington School Board Chair, and uh, Jeff Wick, uh, Burlington School Board Vice Chair. I believe I have those titles mm -hmm. correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, they're here with us in person. And um, I believe we also have joining us uh, virtually um, two students from Burlington High School, uh, Ailsa O'Neill Dunn. I apologize if I'm getting names wrong, but please correct me. Um, and Sylvan Franklin, um, as well as we may have some other uh, statements from other students uh, joining. Um, with that, I think uh, I would ask, um, uh, well, either Claire or Jeff, if you guys could maybe provide us about a, maybe a two minute summary kind of of recent um, happenings with respect to the high school, just for to bring people who might not be fully following the topic kind of closer to up to speed. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us here. <clears throat> it's nice to get the message out to our Ward 6 residents, and I'm thrilled that you included students in this evening tonight, and I'm excited to hear from them. Where we are is we are um, at 67 Cherry Street. Um, over a year ago, uh, last September, uh, we had to um, leave Institute Road um, due to high levels of PCB. Um, and we were remote um, until March of 2021, where we were able to retrofit uh, the old Macy's department store for our thousand students and faculty um, and staff. Over the past, um, would it be six months, seven months, we've made some improvements. Um, we know the issues that we face within that um, facility, uh, sound and um, no windows, but we are making strides and we worked this summer um, based on student, faculty and staff uh, input um, on how to improve that space. But we feel incredibly fortunate that a location existed for us uh, to continue in-person learning given our situation. Um, and at this time, uh, we are working as a board. We have two board meetings this month, December 7th, next Tuesday, and the following December 14th, where we will be discussing um, of late uh, the new um, levels that the state came out with uh, over the last two weeks about PCB contamination and be able to uh, levels, um, thresholds, um, approved thresholds, and how that impacts our uh, path forward. But first and foremost, we are very fortunate. Um, we worked really hard with Governor Scott. Um, he was able to um, work with us and give us $3.5 million to actually upfit Macy's. Um, so that did not come at the cost of taxpayers, um, Burlington taxpayers. And that um, we really felt strongly based on the fact that the Department of Health and the EPA 
um, had given us those guidelines about closing Institute Road. So we were appreciative of our state government in affording us the, that dollar amount to be able to make Macy's our, our high school for the next three years. Um, and we are, it, the footprint is um, the same square footage that we need uh, for our high school. So it is large enough. And we look forward to um, the opportunity to have families come in. We have limited, um, the challenging part is we've limited families to be able to come into Macy's because of COVID and the pandemic. Um, and we've only had one real event where we had a chorus, our fall concert, um, parents were able to come in. So I hear the frustration of families not being able to come into the building, but we're just trying to follow um, safety and health so that we can remain open five days a week um, and be successful. So that was long winded. I touched upon a lot of things, but that's our snapshot. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Um, Michelle, do you want to kind of sure. kick off the questions? Sure. So uh, Nelson and I are sort of co moderating. We'll go back and forth. And the way we've structured this presentation is that we're going to ask each of you panelists to answer a question, two questions. And the first question is, we want to hear from each of you um, an update on how things are going at Macy's. And I know you brought that in a bit, but we want to hear the perspective of each of you or of how things are going at Macy's. We want to ask you to limit it to two minutes. So we have time for you to answer two questions and then to respond to any questions from our participants. So Jeff, we'll start with you and we'll get back to you, Claire. But Jeff, if you could just give us in two minutes how you see things going at Macy's currently. Great, thanks, Michelle. Well, um, I am a parent of three boys and one of my boys happens to be a sophomore at BHS. And so I ask him, periodically since we moved into Macy's. How's it going? Do you like it? You know, what are the good things? What are the bad things? And at least his name's Daniel. At least from Daniel's perspective, he is, uh, he's very happy there. Um, I certainly acknowledge that, uh, you know, building without windows is not a long-term solution. That troubles me a bit, because uh, I think natural light is very, very important. Um, but uh, from my son Daniel's perspective, things are going well. I ask him about the, the noise. Is it too loud in there? And, and he, he's, he's doing well there. So I'm very happy. I don't feel that he's, uh, I'm just using him as an example. Um, I don't feel that he's suffering as a result in terms of his academic learning. And that pleases me. I do think that before we got into Macy's, when we were fully remote, I do know that he's uh, all kids, but I'm going to use him because I, I know firsthand, but I'm assuming that to some degree, what happens to him is uh, indicative of others, but the all remote learning was not ideal. And there was a lot of learning loss there relative to what it would have been in person. So I'm so delighted we're in person. Um, and all in all, I'm not terribly displeased. I'm, I guess I'm, I'm pleased about our, our temporary solution. So I think it's going well, you know, relatively speaking. Great. Okay. That's perfect, Jeff. Thanks so much. Um, so we have two students here. They're juniors at BHS. We have Elsa. Oh, well done. And we um, introduced you, Elsa. I'd like you to chime in now and tell us what you think about what your experience has been as a student in the Macy's building. Can you Hi. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Am I, yes. am I good? Okay, thank you so much for, you know, having me on this and Sylvan. Great, you know, great opportunity to get the student's perspective and I appreciate that. Um, so how has my experience been at Macy's so far? Um, it's it's been interesting. Um, it's had its challenges, you know, the the noise and the lack of windows um, and things like that. But um, you know, I'm lucky to have a lot of great teachers and great friends, and you know, everyone makes it work and kind of is 
trying to figure out a way to um, uh, sort of uh, like make make Macy's home. For, you know, we had the like BHS Macy's parade. <laughs> that was fun. Kind of like building building the community back from like um, being taken away from the old high school, going online, and all of that. So yeah, it's it's had its ups and downs, but you know. I, I appreciate like all the time that has gone into like trying to make it work as best as possible. And yeah. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Elsa. So Claire, why don't you chime in? Yeah, I think I love hearing, uh, like I said, I want to hear from the students and um, you won't hurt our feelings. We just have to always hear like, what can we improve and, and work together? I know science has been challenged. Um, we finally moved all of our science materials. So science classes, um, you know, speaking to teachers or, um, you know, maybe teachers with louder voices, you know, we were able to position them once we moved in um, after the first spring semester to the fall. Um, I know lunch is incredibly crowded um, and that's concerning to us. And so, you know, bringing that to the attention of Principal McBride and the admin and administration. Um, and, you know, again, working with the students, they're the ones experiencing it. And Jeff and I are volunteering, you know, our time so that the student experience is, you know, you only have junior year once and you'll have senior there, senior year once. And so we're, completely sensitive to um, time issues uh, and, and making improvements um, as best we can uh, when we're made aware of them. Um, I remember when we first, the day after we closed, we toured Macy's and I was thinking we could take it by eminent domain because look, this was a place that we could use. The state had recommended the Champlain Valley Fairgrounds or trailers and I thought, oh my goodness, like, let's hope that this can work out. And the first thing people said was, we'll have to turn off the escalator because, you know, high school kids won't be mature enough to use the escalators. And, you know, the good thing is, you know, on occasion, you know, someone might hit the button and that's totally annoying, but, um, and that's really the only reason why it's ever down uh, or looks like it needs repair. But people, the students are mature and um, they are appreciative. And I get that sense of appreciative because like Jeff had said and Elsa had said, you know, remote, over 50% of our population is on free and reduced lunch and getting your breakfast, lunch and dinner at school is absolutely a necessity for a majority of our population. And when that we were remote, um, the welfare of our students and our fellow classmates um, was at risk. And so we feel lucky that we can check in with students on a daily basis and put up with the, you know, the, the things that might frustrate us on a daily basis that, you know, make it challenging to be at school there. But all in all, I just really appreciate hearing the positivity because we have to be um, otherwise, you know, this is our situation. So I appreciate the positivity and respect the disappointment you know, of certain things like not having whole school assemblies, but we had our first whole school opportunity to meet at the Flynn Theater two Fridays ago, um, excuse me, three Fridays ago, and having more of those opportunities to meet as a whole community, because I can imagine Elsa and the students haven't even really met the freshmen or seen the so you know sophomores, um, and so building school community is really important to us, and we haven't had a chance to really do that. Great, thank you, Claire. Sylvan, if you could chime in and let us know your experience. Is the audio working? Yep. All right. Um, my overall experience <clears throat> has been positive. I think. Uh, the design of the Macy's building is, is the interior design is really nice, uh, very clean, uh, and well built. There are, of course, some problems like the, the loud noise and the escalators can sometimes malfunction and um, yeah, but overall, I think it's been pretty good. There's most of the classrooms are different than each other. Some of them are nicer. Some of them are, I think, worse than classes in old BHS, but um, I think a lot of people are moving into it nicely, and personally, I uh, I really enjoy it. Great, thanks. So the second question we wanted to ask 
is what is your hope for the future of the permanent home for BHS? And I know there are a lot of unknowns right now and the administration is in touch with the state and they're discussing this new development of the higher threshold for the actionable level of PCBs. Mm -hmm. So that does change the whole discussion, I would imagine, particularly if the old school is habitable. So given that the situation is in flux, which is, that's the asterisk, what do you hope for the permanent home for BHS? And we'll just go through the same order. Jeff, why don't you kick this off? Oh, okay, thanks, Michelle. Yes, flux is right as a result of the new new guidelines, but as those who've looked at our PCB testing results and compared them to the new guidelines, it's, st it's still a mixed bag uh, with respect to the 40 odd uh, rooms we tested. And as we all know, the F building, which is the tech center, their numbers, their PCB numbers were so high that um, even under the new guidelines, it's still uninhabitable. Um, so we, as, as well, we have asked our superintendent to uh, find the right professionals to give us an opinion as to whether uh, under the new guidelines, what changes. Is BHS under the new guidelines safe? Could it be made safe? What mitigation measures might be taken if it's not quite safe, but could be made safe. In other words, not necessarily for the long term, because I think we all knew uh, in the community during this whole what we called re-envisioning process about the existing high school's faults. One of them is accessibility uh, for those with disabilities, and that's not going to change as a result of PCB levels. So we need to do something, and there are a host of other issues. Uh, related to deferred maintenance and things like that. But the question for me uh, that I've been thinking is, if it turns out BHS is safe, um, there's no need to make changes too quickly. We're all doing head spins from everything we've been going through over the last year and a half. But there is a, possi a possibility, I'm just saying I have no idea if it's that realistic. We'll find out. That's why we're hiring uh, environmental consultants to, to give us a, a, an opinion, but uh, I could potentially envision if it were deemed safe or could be made safe by some certain mitigation measures, um, if, and this is just a speculation, just my idea, this is not the official position of the board or the superintendent, but going back into buildings A through E next year, which would allow Macy's um, to provide, to serve as something we've desperately needed as a school district what I'll call swing space to enable us to do other capital uh, improvement and deferred maintenance projects that have been on our list for years, but which we haven't done because we can't find a place to put the kids. And so if you look online, you can find what these projects are, but if we could, and this might not work for other reasons, but I also like the idea that if we could go back, it has windows, it's next to the athletic fields, it's got some green space, you know, a bunch of stuff that Macy's doesn't have, I'm okay if that vision doesn't work out, but I'm, it's given me a little bit of optimism. And then the board can, but perhaps needs to take a, take a fresh look as to what we, what we should do for the long term. Um, I do think for the long term, in the long term, we do need something what I'll call a new high school for all the reasons that we were gonna renovate the existing one and then for all the reasons that we had decided a month or two ago before the state's guidance changed that we were going to build a new one. Um, but I do think if, you know, if by chance it were safe, it would give us some more options. So I'm not sure. Everything is still in flux. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to land on an answer at this point. Um, Elsa, what would you like to see as the future home for BHS? Um. Let's see. I, I uh, do a lot of sports. And so like one of the hard things has been being like away from the athletic fields because it takes longer to get there. And then like you end up leaving later and then there's less time for homework. So it's like, um, 
so I miss I miss that and like uh yeah I don't know the old property is just so nice you have so much green space you're kind of like being downtown is nice in many ways and I think there's a lot of positive aspects of it it's closer to everyone but also it can be somewhat distracting sometimes I think and um you don't have like a lot of space at the campus um yeah as far as like uh it's interesting with like to like what happens now with like the new PCB level change but I think I don't know uh people are would be a little bit worried uh, people that I've talked to and myself a little bit worried about like going back in not as much for ourselves but for like teachers that would be there for a long time just because like I think everyone's not sure like quite like why they changed like the levels and what you know what is really safe and what's not um but I don't know I think it sounds like it's also a, would be a challenge to build a new high school there so yeah I guess the old campus is my ideal place um but yeah I I know that there's a lot of challenges in every um option so yeah Thanks, Elsa. Okay, we want to make sure we give time to our participants who may have questions. So if great. you could concisely yeah. answer the question. Yeah, I would say uh, the best news is that over six months, or actually less, four months, we heard loud and clear from this community that Institute Road is where the future of BHS belongs. And it is our job to be fiscally responsible uh, to taxpayers, as well as uh, safety um, for our students and our faculty. I greatly appreciate what you said. So we're gonna do our best to um, make the right decisions um, for Institute Road to succeed as the future home, whatever that may be. Great, yeah. thank you. Sylvan, what is your idea of the ideal permanent home for DHS? Um, I think for me, the most important thing is proximity to buses. I know um, from old BHS, it was kind of a hassle to get home because a bus only runs about every 20 minutes and that can be a little bit unreliable. Uh, what's nice about the Macy's location is it's right next to the bus terminal. So regardless of where you're going, you can, there's usually a couple buses going um, either north or south or depending on where you're trying to get to. Um, but having having a school kind of out at the far ends of the bus's reach where there's only one bus line uh, it can be a little annoying when you're trying to get somewhere especially if you have to make a connecting bus during the winter but um, I feel like that could also be that could also be uh, fixed by just adding a couple more buses that go on the same route for for um, Institute Road. I think they did that in the first year I was at BHS, um, just after people got out of school. So that really helped. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Sylvan. And um, another student, um, Saraswati, Ch I'm going to watch her last name, Chetri, um, wanted to participate. She couldn't do it in person, but she texted me her response. And in terms of how things are going at Macy's, she said, honestly, I like going to Macy's because, because it is closer to my house and it's located near multiple different food places. It also has a bus stop nearby and that can be really helpful. The placement is very convenient. However, I feel like one bad part about Macy's is how it's built. There aren't a lot of doors in the classrooms and the walls don't even touch the ceilings. The building inside could be better. And in terms of a future home for BHS, Saraswati said, I think we are good where we are right now. Macy's could potentially be our permanent school if classrooms were properly built and if we actually had a gym. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's a range of opinions about the future home of BHS. Um, what we'd also <laughs> like to do is hear from any of our participants if they have comments or questions. Um, yeah, please chime in. They can raise their hands and then we can. Yeah, please raise your hands. I see Amy Mellencamp right in front of me. Oh, her hand is raised. Okay. Who unmute? 
she's on mute. Um, let me just quickly thank the students and certainly Jeff and Claire because what a complicated situation it's been the last couple of years. Um, but I, I guess I, my only comment would be is I was always interested in the solution of using a building, which is an expensive building given the gym and the auditorium. If that could be rehabbed and then a new part put out on the parking lot, I think it's sort of the best of both worlds in terms of, of a new energy efficient, thoughtfully designed educationally experience for students. Um, but also it uses uh, the strong bones that are already in place in a building. But of course, I think it's great that, the, that there's going to be consultants advising the board and I'm sure people will make the best decisions possible. And I really admire the students for making the most of it. So um, my, hat's, my hat's off to you students for, for really um, having the strongest experience you can at the high school. Thank you, Amy. Anyone else in person? Yeah. Oh. Uh, it looks like I'm sorry. I'm gonna <laughs> mispronounce your name, but Glennis Fox. I saw your hand up. Ah. Did I get that even close to your name? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. Thanks. Um, um, I I have a question that's based on what Sylvan asked, said about the buses. Do you think if they um, if BHS moves back to Institute Road, uh, it would work with the city to uh, make buses easier. Um, as a parent who lives on the very far edge of the South End, um, traveling to and from that old uh, BHS can take an hour or more for my student. And so um, it's, uh, the downtown BHS is so much better for that. It's, you know, it's a straight shot and no changing buses. And I probably, I'm, I'm wondering what fraction of the population lives on the far edges so that the commute is that long and what the city could do to, to you know, or, or what um, the school district could do with working with the transportation to, help make this less of a, a hardship on kids. Great, thank you, Glennis. Yeah. Claire, do you wanna? Sure. Then we have one more. Yep, um, we hear you loud and clear. Um, we have worked with GMT um, and I think uh, that is our goal for the future. So the farthest south is South Meadow or South Cove neighborhood. The farthest north is Northgate down to the Colchester border. And in doing our history over the last, you know, eight years, and Amy Mellencamp can speak to that as the former principal and the re-envisioning, the site of Burlington High School was chosen as a equal um, in the middle to the length of the, the city sort of uh, proximity to both north and south. But it's unacceptable if we're hearing from students that, you know, they're, they're unable to get home um, because the lack of buses. I, I mean, I see them when the three buses fill up um, and you're out of luck, at, you know, three o'clock. Um, and so we have to make improvements. Um, we work closely with many parents and advocates who want a transportation plan um, and buses that you know, if you miss a South End bus going north to BHS on Institute Road, what's your next option? It doesn't come for 40 minutes. So we're aware of that. Um, and this is where student voice, um, they can tell us, you know, what those issues are. And I know that as well, many students would reach out to us saying after seven o'clock or, you know, that they wouldn't, bus drivers wouldn't pick up students at the Institute Road because after seven, your bus pass didn't work. And we, again, worked through um, those problematic situations. But GMT is on board with us uh, and will work with us um, when, had they always have when we have issues like this. But um, I hear you. I think we all know the corner to the police station in North Avenue and the development of Cambrian Rise on that two lane road um, is problematic. Um, and so having more transportation um, to reduce stress for students in the early morning, um, a lot of that was we changed the start time to school to nine o'clock. 
um, that was a huge development for us. And we heard parents loud and clear um, and we acted upon it. That had been talked about for 10 years since I lived here and we finally did it this year. And I think it has benefited um, transportation throughout the city and where we're going. Uh, so as always, tell us your feedback uh, and we hear you loud and clear. Thank you, Claire. It looks like Andy Barker has a comment or a question. Hi, everybody. Um, again, gratitude to the panel. Thanks, Jeff, Claire, Elsa, Sylvan. Nice to hear from you guys. Very articulate and thoughtful. Um, I want to just um, put in a plug. I love the discussion about uh, transit, making sure that's well thought out. Um, I love to hear uh, the conversation about building a, a really energy efficient building. I think we should be looking at net zero. I, I really hope we build a high school for the future, not for the present. Um, but the thing I want to um, say tonight is I, I would love to um, create more formal, more accessible ways for students to be active partners in the redesign of the high school. And um, I think we should get creative. We're in the era of flexible pathways. We should create a class that's for credit that has kids who want to be full time thinking about collaborating with adults. Um, I think that could be spectacularly successful. Um, and I think there are other ways too. But um, my main plug is, is really to ask um, that we really think creatively about how to get lots of diverse student input because they are the uh, you know, the users, and um, they also have a stake in this in a way that all of us as well-meaning adults don't. I also think that'll be super helpful for um, being able to build community support for funding, you know, to bonding to build an expensive new building. It will be expensive. So that's my plug. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, I actually had a question that he developed and then went further with, and my question was, is there a formal forum for students to contribute their comments or to query administrators about the future BHS and how much are they a part of the decision-making? So um, that was my question. I just wanna check how we're doing for time. We got about five minutes. We got about five minutes. Um, so in the last five minutes, if Elsa or Sylvan want to jump in, please just hop on. But in the, I would like to hear from uh, one of our commissioners about student involvement in the development of the permanent home. Community. Yeah, you want to take this one? Sure. Thank you both, Michelle and Andy. That's a great idea and it's not too late because we haven't started designing the new building. So I think student voice is very important and we, together with our superintendent, need to figure out how to formalize that and structure that. Great, thanks. Um, Elsa, Sylvan, not like you have to speak for your fellow students, but can you imagine other folks in the student body wanting to participate in the design and development and location of the permanent home for BHS? And Amy, if you have something to say about that, Please chime in. Um, I think so, yeah. And I think especially like having the experience of uh, the current building at, and like we've been through a lot of different high schools. We've seen how like, you know, we now <laughs> know like just how important like walls are. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, I think people are definitely like more invested know in like what they want to see in a high school and um I don't know like we had a conversation recently in in class about like what would a lockdown look like because when you don't have doors and like your wall don't go to the ceiling and you know so I think uh, people are much more in tune with with the building and um yeah I think I think people will definitely be interested in um helping more with the construction of the new high school Sure. Thank you, Elsa. Sylvan, do you have something? Uh, yeah. I think uh, a lot of people would have opinions about uh, where to put the school and what they want and out of a new school, but 
um, might not be willing to invest a whole lot of time in it. It might be helpful to send out a kind of general survey about, I don't know, location and what they feel about is important to have in a school, just to get an idea of what to do moving forward. That's great. That's great. Anyone else in the last minute or two of this discussion? I, I had a quick question if I could. Do, do we have a do you have a timeline for the consultants to come up with uh, like what are their milestones and maybe it's too soon for that. You, you mean know. with respect to the new PCB guidance? Yeah. Yeah. You have some people are going to advise you what's their timeline. Yep. So. We don't know yet, but okay. you can be <laughs> sure we've asked that it's as soon as possible. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Who are who are they? The engineers who work for the state, or We're, no? It's I mean we will involve the state to the extent they're willing, but it's my understanding, and this is at its early stages. Because keep in mind, when did we all become aware? Yeah, through seven days of the guidance a week or two ago. <laughs> so we're moving as quickly as possible to identify the right consultants and uh, have them tell us. Well, we'll tell them what we want, and they'll tell us what the uh, timeline looks like, and we'll we'll telegraph that out to the public as, as soon as we know. Thanks. You're great. Um, I think we're out of time. I want to thank all of our panelists and each of you who participated and asked your questions and provided your comments. Um, this is certainly an important and um, it's a topic with a shifting target. So thank you so much for all your um, contributions this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks everyone, that was excellent. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at the attendees list and I'm, I'm hoping that BPRW2 might be our next um, presenter who would be uh, Sophie Swale from the Brunswick Park Center Recreation and Waterfront group. Is that true? Can you promote BPRW2 to a panelist? Um, the next topic, uh, assuming that is Sophie, um, is uh, an update on the Callahan Park Master Plan. Um, Sophie, can you confirm? Your yeah, that, that is Sophie. I yes, see her. that's me. <laughs> oh, excellent. <laughs> um, well, uh, take it away, um, if you can. Um, am I able to share a screen? Yes. I don't see. Oh, here we go. Okay. Sorry about that. I wasn't sure where it was. I think we just promoted you to that. That's okay. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right. If everybody can let me know if you see the first slide of the yes. Callahan Park. Thank you. Um, so thanks for having me tonight. Um, as many of you probably know, we're uh, nearing the end of the master plan process for Callahan Park. And we had a final public meeting yesterday, but we're still um, garnering feedback on the final plan uh, for the park. Um, and I'd just like to preface uh, the, the process by saying that we know that Callahan Park is a great park and a lot of people enjoy it, love it, don't want anything changed. Um, and our intent was not to come here with um, an eraser and, and start from scratch. It was to look at the park in terms of connections, uh, accessibility, um, visibility, programming, and how we can make it better because we know that there are always some tweaks that can happen in any kind of either park, city, building, et cetera. And that's how we came into the project and that's how we're um, hoping to exit the project. Although um, we know it's just the beginning of um, the plan because um, now we'll, the next step will be implementation essentially. Um, and I'll say that also we don't have a big pot of funding uh, to implement each per, each part of the pro plan. However, we do have um, funding allocated in this fiscal year to replace the playground, which um, if you've been by Callahan lately, you'll see that there's no slide. There are different parts that have been removed because um, like many of our playground structures, they were installed 30 years ago and they're Ending, uh, reaching their end of life, essentially. And for safety purposes, we are trying to preserve as many as we can as we don't have funding to replace everything all at once. But um, 
Callahan, thankfully, is the next one on the docket to have its um, playground replaced. So with that, I'll just let you know, I, I'm just going through a few of the slides that we went through last night. If you want to see the entire presentation, it was recorded and the slides will be available on our project page in the coming days. Um, so just to let you know, um, the process for the master plan has been ongoing since basically February of last year, or sorry, it's still this calendar year, um, where we start with uh, hiring a consultant to help us out to gather data, to assess the site, and then to launch into a thorough outreach um, process with the public. And so we've gone through a public meeting, some surveys, uh, developing concepts, another public meeting, and then um, showing some preferred plans and then the final public meeting um, that was held last night to present the final plan. And the next step will be the final report. So that being said, in terms of community outreach, um, I won't read all of this, but we did have a questionnaires where 188 people responded, focus groups, specifically athletic groups, gardening groups, you name it. We tried to hit um, different users of the park that may not attend public uh, meetings or that um, the topic was specific to the use within the park. And then we had virtual public workshops, online surveys, in-person um, tabling at the par park, and then small outreach um, to uh, specifically the city and lake um, class at uh, BHS. The focus group provided a lot of specific feedback to their needs within the park. Um, most of it, uh, really about enhancing the different functions that they rely on uh, within the park. Then we had a public workshop where 40 people attended in May and provided feedback on the different, uh, their different needs and identifying um, where gaps were in the park. Those are some of the notes that were uh, compiled during that um, virtual workshop where we had little breakout groups. And we had a second public workshop, um, not ideally held in August. It was a really beautiful night. So we had 22 attendees. And based on that, we got some great feedback, but we decided um, it would be best to go out into the park and interact with people one-on-one -on, -one on the project um, so that we would garner more um, feedback on the different four different concepts that were presented. So as such, we had boards up in the park for uh, a week at, during different events like so piggybacking out soccer practice or um, uh, I think mainly soccer because it was in the middle of summer, but um, just to make sure there was already a concentrated population in the park, but we also advertised that to the general public and put the survey online as well. So asking people which options they preferred and not confining it to one concept or another, but really thinking about it of what do you like in what concept A, what do you like in concept D, and how can we kind of um, take all that feedback and create a what we call a Frankenstein of all the different plans, essentially. So what we presented last night was that Frankenstein, which doesn't look too ugly here. Um, just to give you an idea of all the different um, uh, ideas that were um, integrated into the plan, uh, with the consultant, we developed uh, several uh, kind of goals um, based on the surveys and, and community feedback. And rather than walk you through all the different parks to the park, we'll, I'll walk you through the goals and how we achieve those through the, through the plan. So one of the goals was to improve circulation and connection within Callahan Park, including the entrances. If you're familiar with the park, you'll know that it's impossible to know it's there from Shelburne Road unless you are going there and your GPS tells you it's there. So we wanna make sure that connection is made. And then along Pine Street, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, there's no kind of opening along Pine except on the side of the park um, near a locust. So we really wanna make that connection happen, especially um, anticipating the multi-use path coming with a Champlain Parkway, which will run along the western edge of the park, and then the Shelburne Road roundabout that's in construction right now. So to do that, we've identified a primary routes within the park, mainly north, south, and east-west primary connection along the park. And then these focus points, um, you know, uh, relating to the surrounding community 
streets. And then looking at the a secondary series of networks within the park to connect the different uses and um, amenities. And then we also, as I mentioned before, accessibility is a priority um, in our reevaluation of our parks. And so wanting to increase that accessibility, but knowing that the topography at Callahan can be challenging, uh, we looked at the grading and how that could work around the park. And the pink is basically um, paths that would be accessible um, to everybody. The, uh, along Locust Street, we'd have to do ramps um, because of the, the change in grade there. But then, um, then there's a whole network to go through um, to connect the facilities. And then another goal was to acknowledge that our building is also reaching its end of life and uh, evaluating whether it's in the right place for when we go to rebuild or to build a new, especially restrooms at Callahan Park. And uh, in doing so, we evaluated that the best location for it was still to, to remain near the um, small ball field, but, and also connected to the playground, which will be here, and, but also um, connect itself better to the multi-use fields. And then seeing how big the park is and knowing that the courts are also used and then there's winter um, use of the uh, future location of a rink here, um, adding in additional restrooms up here so that people who are in the garden or using the courts have access nearby to a restroom. And then also this is close to the um, bigger fields. So this gives you an idea of what we're thinking in terms of um, a building. We, it's not designed by any means at this point, it's just the location and concept. But um, we did hear concerns of uh, if a building was near the road that it would um, cut off the visibility into the park. So the thought is that it would be a dog leg building where this is a breezeway and this is a covered area so people could sit outside recognizing that climate change is a def definite challenge for us um, now and also in the future. But that then these would be buildings with uh, that could have the snack shack in it, um, restrooms, equipment storage for both the multi-use field and um, the this um, play. Uh, sorry, the playground and uh, the ball field. And then in the other um, building, which we're calling the pavilion, would be a roof um, and uh, would have a roof on top of it, but not being closed except for the restroom area and storage facilities, um, but that it would provide in the summer a space for people to gather and um, you know, reserve like in other parks for, for um, gatherings. And then in the winter, it could be a, um, a, a rink space so that um, our volunteers who work so hard on the ice rinks in the winter and are challenged also by climate change would have an easier time of maintaining that, that facility during the winter. And it would also allow us the possibility of adding some lighting to the, to the rink. And then, as I mentioned, we have funding for a playground. Um, so we designated this area as a playground uh, for the future. Um, the playground is currently um, more or less in this area. And knowing that the building is currently here, we'll be phasing the playground in with a phase one in this area where we can remove the existing playground and then put in new structures. There's a, a high demand for our community gardens and especially at Callahan Park. Um, so an extension of the, the community garden here would be happening in term and in a terraced um, fashion so that we're acknowledging the slope here um, within the garden um, and celebrating it really um, by not um, grading it up or sloping everything up to, to meet the existing, we would really work with that. And then in terms of improving um, or expanding athletic resources, there's an acknowledgement that there's a need for um, uh, an angle backstop for the, the field um, and then uh, that we're, we're still looking at um, having the smaller rink up, up here in that location, as I mentioned, the covered rink. And then for the basketball courts, um, we, we heard um, that um, 
fences would be very helpful because currently the basketball court doesn't have a fence and the balls roll down the, the slopes and go everywhere. So especially with the pavilion next door, we wouldn't want the basketball to go into the pavilion as you're trying to eat a sandwich. Um, so that would be definitely a feature we, we're looking to implement when we go to renovate the basketball courts. And also thinking that the fence would also provide an option for a multi-use um, futsal or lacrosse as other options to be used on that surface. And then in terms of um, tennis, we have data that shows that tennis is um, still, still, there's still an active tennis population, but there, it's also um, lower than when it was when we installed the tennis courts. And there's a high demand for pickleball. So pickleball would uh, take over one of the courts here um, and be um, added to this as a, another facility. And then, as I mentioned, there's multi-use spaces like the pavilion, but also acknowledging that the sledding hill is very highly used. We wanna continue that. We'd like to look at um, year round restrooms. Right now they're only seasonal. And the same thing for the restrooms near the ice skating rinks. Um, and then I, uh, the, you know, that knowing there are pat people who use um, the multi-use field as um, cross country or uh, snowshoeing, that these are potential additional paths around there. And then gathering spaces was also a, a goal that we heard from the community. So making this space a gathering area with some cover as well because of the sun. And then um, also just seeing the flexibility of an alley up here, as well as um, acknowledging that community gardens are obviously another gathering space. Another um, concern was the pres preservation of views um, because we can, especially at this time of the year, you can see the lake and the mountains beyond from Callahan Park. So making sure that when we're um, citing new things and moving things around a little bit, that we're considering those views. And then we, uh, con especially this time of the year, we hear a lot of requests for lighting of different facilities, um, including, uh, like I mentioned, the ice skating rink and the courts once uh, uh, the sun starts to set very early, um, as well as the uh, baseball field throughout the year. And then um, part of our overall goal too, is to acknowledge that there's uh, stormwater challenges on the site and looking to improve that with ecological approaches to the design. Um, looking at a bioretention system near Gove Court to um, um, hold some of that water. Um, looking at uh, uh, water infiltration in the soccer fields the next time we're ready to renovate the fields. And then we are also working with our colleagues at uh, Wastewater and they're planning on installing a CSO tank, uh, combined sewer overflow tank down here before it goes into the, the lake or the barge canal um, center essentially. And then the possibility of when they go to construct this is that we would be able to renovate the fields and add in under drains into the field that could help with the soggy situation down there. So this is a close up of that bioretention area down at Gulf Court around the existing shed. And then the tree trench where we could also infiltrate some water. And also to, um, to use the existing woods that are there and provide more of a, or enhance the drainage down there into a constructed wet, wetland. So some of the water could go in that direction as well. And then again, on the theme of ecology and access is just thinking about the way we manage um, the, our different parks and how we can, one, reduce our uh, maintenance needs um, because that's high and is also uh, environmentally heavy sometimes, especially with uh, ball fields and um, athletic fields. But knowing, acknowledging that the, that's the way they have to be maintained for those uses, but around there, there's a possibility to add in a native thicket or meadows and the rain gardens as previ previously mentioned and do low mow in some areas to help increase the beneficial insects and pollinators in our community. 
And this is looking at the different um, plant communities, tree communities that are there and, and to um, identify ways to diversify it um, and not feel like um, what we're going through with uh, um, emerald ash borer that then we have a bare palette and have to start over. So if we diversify it, we're hoping to avoid additional challenges in that, in that sense. And the same, so the same thing here is this, these are the additions of, of different tree species. Um, in terms of um, the path uh, boardwalk that's been suggested down from the corner of Pine Street, that it would come in here and be more of a adventure trail. And so there'd be more interaction with the, with the um, ecology there. Currently there's a lot of social paths through there, but there's nothing formalized. So looking at formalizing it in that way, making it more educational. So sorry to have run through that pretty quickly, but um, it, again, as I mentioned, we have the full presentation on our project webpage and I'm happy to take any questions that I can answer um, right now, <laughs> if there's time. Anna. Anna's got a question. Oh, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. I can't see. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. Sorry. Uh, Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. This is actually the first time I've, I've looked at the updated report on, on this park, which is uh, definitely near and dear to our family's hearts. So um, it looks like a, a lot of wonderful improvements. Um, I had a question about seeding uh, throughout the park. It's, um, there really is nowhere, uh, aside from the bleachers outside of the Little League field where um, people can sit. And I, mm -hmm. I noticed that during the soccer games, their you know, parents are standing everywhere. I was wondering if there was any consideration for a series of benches throughout the park, perhaps like memorial benches that families could contribute to, to put uh, or donate uh, and have a family member's name on it. Is there any consideration for some seating benches throughout the park? Absolutely. Um, that was definitely one thing we heard loud and clear during the process. And we we spent time there too. And um, one of my colleagues used to live adjacent to that. So we, we know that need is there. Um, so I didn't highlight that because it's a bit of a more detailed um, part of the pro project, but there are um, things like um, integrated seating into the hillside here, the same over here near the, the ball field. Um, seating around the playground is also something that's um, important to us. There's an overlook down here. Um, I'm, I can't find all the benches, but I know we've added some in. I, there's some along the courts as well so that people can watch the basketball or the tennis happening. Um, so those, there's, that's definitely part of our planning process. It's just a bit more um, at a bigger scale than this, this has been at, but it, it's um, as we uh, look to improve say the playground, that's something we'll look to site at that time too with the new play structures. So that, for example, parents can watch their kids, et cetera. So I appreciate that feedback. Yeah, great. Thank, thank you. I also just wanted to ask a question about the little playground up by mm -hmm. the basketball courts. Or is, mm -hmm. that, is that going away? It has gone away already. Um, there's only a, a swing left right now because that play structure was um, unsafe. It was removed last year. Um, so when we were looking at the master plan, that's what, one of the reasons why we did this planning effort was to look at whether it should stay up there or be integrated um, as part of the larger play area. And that's where it, that level of play will be as well. So everything will be near the restrooms and all together. So if you have children that are different ages and stages, you're not worried about where they are um, within the, the park. They're all going to be in the same area. That's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. If there are no other questions, I think we're a little over time on this one. I want to make sure we're being respectful to our other attendees. But Sophie, thank you so much. That was uh, a great presentation. Um, and um, I think, uh, as you said, this will be available on your website. And people, you're still looking for feedback. Is that
that correct? That's correct. Great. Thanks, and sorry for running over. No, no, that, that was excellent. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right, uh, moving on to the next uh, agenda topic. Um, we were joined by Brian Sheena, um, founding member of Is Good, which is the Isham Street Gardening and Other Optimistic Doings uh, group. He's also a uh, state representative. Um, Brian, are you ready to uh, share some uh, good and optimistic doings with us? <laughs> We promote uh, Brian yeah Brian needs to I believe this is working so I'll jump right in um so I'm, I'm uh, Brian China from the old north end thanks for inviting me into um, the south end MPA um, I'm here because people from around the city have asked if I would come to their MPAs to talk about the work of Is Good and about a pilot project we will be proposed in, in our local MPAs. Um, do I still have 10 minutes or do I only have five minutes? 10, ten minutes, go for it. Okay. If people want to see a longer version of this, they can um, check it out in the Ward 5 MPA from earlier or from last month. Um, so I'm just going to share the screen and jump in and I'll do a quick version of this. So, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a program, a neighborhood outreach worker now program pilot project um, idea that came out of discussions about quality of life and public safety, um, um, inspired by Is Good, Isham Street Gardening, and other optimistic doings. Um, and the neighborhood outreach worker program would be a community development program grounded in transformative justice that will cultivate public safety by building relationships, improving access to social health care and economic resources, and growing community competency to manage quality of life issues. And um, before I talk about this idea, I should tell you a little bit about Is Good. Um, so Is Good is a mutual aid and community building project that has transformed Isham Street over the past 12 years or so from being um, what some people would have said is one of the worst streets in Burlington to being a model for how neighbors can improve their quality of life. And you can see here um, some of the founders of Is Good and UVM staff and uh, the mayor and department heads um, and, uh, over the years working together um, on this project. So the roots of Is Good is mutually between neighbors, basically myself and two other na uh, neighbors on each side of me started gardening the green belt together. We met um, UVM staff and we told them our vision of, of creating an entire garden down one, one whole side of the street. Um, they gave us some grant money to, because it involved partnership between neighbors um, who were students and not students. Um, and then this led to a, uh, a visioning session where we came up with basically a vision, um, a five phase vision for Is Good. Um, and this five phase action plan, we've got three of the five phases complete. Phase one was one whole side of the street of Isham Street has been transformed into a garden. Uh, phase two, it jumped to the other side of the street. Phase three, it now extends down Hickok Street. And we're beginning phase four, um, which will be to create a garden walkway uh, along Hickok, Isham, Booth, Russell, and Charles, linking Union and Willard Street and connecting with Pomeroy Park. And then phase five would be to grow and connect with other existing community gardens so that there's garden walkways that are connecting all across the city. Um, so the soil of is good is economic and social support, which is a uh, human and economic resources, the residents of our streets, staff from UVM, residents and staff from Burlington Health and Rehab, students from UVM and local high schools um, through Upward Bound, grants from UVM, the AARP gave us a grant, New England Grassroots Environmental Fund over the years, and CETO. Um, and the fruits of Isgood is that it improved quality of life, that we were in our effort to make the physical and social environment nicer, um, we actually lowered crime rates. And it was so significant that in 2014, the police department wrote a grant with Isgood in which um, uh, we sought to bring the knowledge and skills developed through the Isgood program to other neighborhoods struggling with quality of life issues. Um, and, you, and there was a drop in crime, but also in what um, the police observed in our neighborhood at the time. It, um, this was in 2014. We didn't get this grant, unfortunately, um, but we've continued the work without that funding. Um, 
And uh, as you can see here, through the pandemic, we had to be creative. So um, Isham Street was actually the epicenter of COVID. Uh, 11 of our neighbors died in Burlington Health and Rehab. And one of our neighbors um, died by suicide in April of 2020 because of the impact of the pandemic. And a way for us to cope with this was um, we did some community art and people would stand by these pictures and wave to their loved ones. Um, we brought a band in a truck to play on the street with everyone socially distancing masked in the spring of 2021. 20, um, <clears throat> um, basically, you know, through the pandemic, uh, um, the Office of Student Community Relations and his good work together with support from CEDO to bring neighbors together um, as we face this tremendous loss and trauma as a community and um, existing mutual aid projects like Is Good expanded and filled new roles and new mutual aid project formed during the pandemic to address the failure of our society to take care of all people. Um, as the gaps in the social safety net widened, we, we caught those who fell through the cracks and we took care of each other. So um, we've started phase four. I'm not gonna give a lot of detail. What I would like to do is request to come back in the spring and talk more about phase five because phase five is going to involve every neighborhood in the city as we look at linking garden networks that exist into um, uh, a network of garden walkways that would be a model of urban permaculture. Um, so when I share this presentation with, um, for, with you for the record, you can read some of the details about the work of phase four. So this is a snapshot of some of the current uh, mutual aid in Burlington. You have groups like it is good, which helps which connects people through gardening. Um, you also have like the People's Kitchen, which is um, based in the South End, People's Farm Stand, Food Not Cops, Cop Watch, the Racial Justice Alliance, Migrant Justice, Worker Center, Old North End Mutual Aid. These are groups where people, where neighbors help neighbors um, to meet needs when uh, the public safety system has failed. Um, and so how does uh, Is Good cultivate public safety and improve quality of life? And how can we transplant that, pun intended, to other parts of Burlington? Well, building relationships between people in our environment, changing the physical and social environment influences human behavior. We improve access to resources and we grow community competency to manage quality of life issues using restorative practices, which reduces um, the harm of many kinds of conflict, especially structural conflict, which is an important social determinant of health. And you know, how can the city support this work? Um, working with us to create the walkway, expanding funding for mutual aid, and creating new programs. Because we cannot rely on volunteers to do this work forever. Um, it, it, it's exhausting and you, have, you may have a small group of people who are doing a lot of work um, and I'm putting in a lot of labor and like sort of scraping for grant money, but we should really institutionalize aspects of uh, projects like this that work and embed them into the existing systems of government. So I'll end with, a, this is a little snapshot I made from memory. So it's not totally complete. It's a work in progress of the public safety system of care in Burlington and mutual aid. One thing we're proposing is mutual aid needs to be considered part of this and integrated into this. So that it's not just, uh, we need to support our nonprofits and we need to support mutual aid efforts. Um, and and wait, uh, one way to link that would be to create a neighborhood outreach worker program. And so this is based on my neighborhood on the old North end near UVM. But every neighborhood around Burlington needs an opportunity to come up with ideas like this for what would work in your neighborhood. Um, so in our neighborhood, we, you know, some of the quality of life issues include noise disturbances, parties, disorderly conduct, fighting, fireworks, fires, littering, and vandalism. And what we proposed is that outreach teams be created that are partnerships between students and non-student residents who are neighbors, and that they be trained and paid well. Um, and that they would walk the streets and attend community events to get to know neighbors in advance to prevent harm, that they could provide an unarmed response to quality of life complaints, either in the moment or afterwards, um, that they could facilitate access to emergency services and other resources, follow up after incidents, teach relationship skills and, and design interventions with the community that empower people and that don't use violence or coercion. Um, they also need professional support through supervision. Um, I'm suggesting from a professional social worker, I am a social worker and we do a, lo a lot of work um, in, with self-reflection as social workers because of the trauma we witness and the difficult situations we're in and more um, providers in the public safety system of care need that including the police. Like more of our workers need the, that opportunity and that support when they're doing this difficult kind of work in, with public engagement. Um, this is a list of how the program could be accountable to the community. Um, I'm not going to read it all because I only have a minute left. Um, and how does this fit into the a reimagined public safety system? Well, 
Perhaps unarmed community support liaisons could work with neighborhood outreach workers to provide unarmed responses by peers to most third level 911 calls related to quality of life issues. Um, and if we add in a new mobile crisis program, which is currently there's uh, talk of a bid around this that would create teams of mental health crisis workers, emergency medical technicians, and I would also propose peers um, that could handle most level two calls, then the police could focus on level one calls. Um, and then referrals should be made to services um, by nonprofits, but also with mutual aid. And we should embed peers in every possible piece of the system of care, uh, for example, with the Howard Center starting to do. Um, but ultimately, if we provide people with resources and skills, we will prevent the use of 911 over time and people will get the specialized help they need directly from the source. So I'm gonna skip this part about a vision for public safety. You can see here, what's the damage? This is just a joke because we get lots of damage in my neighborhood, but we fix it quickly because we've learned that that makes a big difference in terms of human behavior. This, this is a proposed budget for the program. I was aiming high. Um, it comes out to about 300 grand a year. Um, and that would provide like people walking the streets on weekend nights, people following up in the days, professional supervision, 50 grand in training for the community. Um, we could spend more or less on a program, but I just wanted to kind of put it in numbers and get a sense of like what the expense would be to try this out. Um, and what are some possible funding sources? UVM could give us money. They could redirect the 100 grand the police haven't been using um, of the money they budget for them towards this. Um, Champlain College could provide some funding. CEDO could apply for federal state private grants and the city could just build it into the budget. Um, and so I'll end with two quotes. Um, by me and the other co-founder of Isgood, Phil Hammersloth um, said, since our first block party in 2010, the culture of the street has evolved. You can see the change, it's palpable. Students say hello to each other. They say hello to us, we talk. There's sharing going on. And I said, the, the key is to inspire someone to do something greater, to unlock our optimistic doings. Start with just acknowledging people who live around you. They notice what you do too, so become a role model. Invite people in and ask for their ideas. And so I'm going around, presenting on the work at Good and on this idea of a outreach worker program in hopes of gaining, um, I'm asking for your ideas, I'm asking for input from people. Um, and I'm hoping that we can continue talking as a community about new and creative ways to invest in a system of public safety um, that, is, that builds equity, promotes equity, <clears throat> improves social determinants of health and um, improves quality of life for everyone. Um, and so, yeah, I'd like to come back in the spring and talk about phase five with you. Um, and I if there's a minute for questions, great. Sure. If not, you can hit me up later. So we have uh, our other representatives, Tiff Lindley and Gabrielle uh, Stennis with us. Um, are, are there any questions for Brian um, before um, we turn it over to Tiff and Gabrielle? Um. Great, Brian. I'm not seeing so any hands up, but Brian, thanks for the presentation. Um, I'm really interested in the ideas. Um, and, and thank you. Thanks. Um, all right. So, um, last on the agenda tonight, um, and, and Tip and Gabrielle, thank you for um, uh, staying on with us. Um, we've sort of had this on the agenda at the same time, and we're going to do it tonight. So, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> this is. Uh, an update from our representatives about sort of the goings on of the, um, the, the Vermont House of Representatives. Um, thank you both for joining us. Um, I'll turn it over to you. Sure. Um, <clears throat> uh, so I'll, I'll kick us off um, and talk a little bit about <clears throat> kind of the uh, give an overview of what the big issues that the legislature is going to deal with this year. Um, of this session and um, then kind of focus on what's gonna be in my committee because we spend most of our time in our committees um, of jurisdiction. <clears throat> Wait a minute, you're leaving. <laughs> you can't leave. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, I'm still here, Tiff, you, you can keep going. Yeah. At any rate, they know it's a bad So, so very quickly, I mean, um, it, it's it's going to be, um, uh, I think, a controversial session. I think it's going to be, it's going to involve <clears throat> a lot of um, 
perseverance, you know, to stay the course and get um, get things done. And um, in the big issue areas that we've identified as priorities, so teacher state pensions, the pupil waiting issue, redistricting <clears throat> props two and five, um, which would explicitly um, prohibit slavery um, or amend the constitution to guarantee reproductive autonomy. Um, <clears throat> this is the second vote that our bodies will be taking on this. Then the, the vote goes to the people of Vermont. Um, I, <clears throat> you know, these particular issues are not insignificant. Um, and we also have uh, recommendations from the Climate Caucus that Gabrielle will talk about. Um, so I spend most of my time in my committee which is general, comma, housing, comma, and military affairs. And the operative word in that is general because it, it we tend to absorb anything that doesn't naturally fall into any other committee. Um, <clears throat> The, the areas um, where we'll be working and where my focus will be with housing, wages and worker protections and social justice. Um, just briefly in terms of housing, um, we have spent a fair amount of time at NPA meetings talking about that issue. Um, there will be new ARPA money that can be invested and we're, our committee will weigh in on that. Um, <clears throat> we also um, hope to pass again um, over the governor's veto, a revolving loan fund investment for first time home buyers with particular outreach to BIPOC Vermonters um, and to invest in recovery housing. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, under wages and worker protections, um, legislation relating to consistent work schedules, uh, removing minimum wage exemptions for uh, that are. Um, that are really date back to um, when the legislation was first passed um, during the New Deal um, uh, <clears throat> seems very important to members of my committee. Um, those exemptions include exemptions for agricultural workers and domestic workers. And there will, I think, be a conversation about um, uh, raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Um, <clears throat> racial equity, um, as, as I have talked a little bit about before, the uh, House passed legislation that apologized for its role in um, uh, supporting eugenics and funding eugenics um, practices. And we, the next step um, as leadership um, and um, our chair has, has defined it and the Social Equity Caucus has uh, weighed in is to uh, pass legislation that would create a truth and reconciliation process. The process, process itself will be defined by members of that commission. Um, there would be no legislators on it. Um, and the purpose would be really to um, <clears throat> to uh, first uh, air history and to develop a um, develop a path towards repairing harm, and that could take a lot of different forms. Um, a lot of a lot of time is spent advocating for people who contact Gabrielle and me for rental or mortgage assistance, resolving UI claims. Um, uh, or the fact that their social security numbers were compromised or need utility assistance. And some of these problems continue to persist. So uh, we are, I'm working very closely um, with including Vermont Legal Aid, but um, the, the state agencies that are involved to try to resolve these issues so that people are not left hanging for the lengths of time that they have been left hanging um, over the last 18 months. Now I'll turn it over to my comrade in arms, Gabrielle. Thank you, Tiff. I want to comment that you also have a third representative, uh, Barbara Rachelson, and she, she has not been able to join. Um, Tiff, uh, Tiff serves on the committee of, I, 
the, the catch-all name is potpourri, basically everything that isn't known to go somewhere goes to her committee. So she gets very many different types of bills. I serve on transportation committee and Barbara Rachelson serves on judiciary. Um, so if you have specific questions, please know that in future, you, you can also reach out to your third, uh, third representative. Uh, I, I want to note also that um, <clears throat> there's a lot to cover in the state house and uh, you know, both of us have tried to tag team when it makes sense. And we've also tried to divide and conquer. Um, so I'm grateful personally to Representative Bloomley for covering things like housing and uh, um, truth and reconciliation uh, and many other issues as I have historically, uh, at least with regards to my day-to-day -day job over the last 10 to 15 years, and now where I serve in house transportation, I've really focused a lot more on climate change and um, workforce development related to jobs that reduce energy costs while increasing jobs here in Vermont that are livable wage jobs. So um, just wanna put it out there that although we're both here, we're both here to serve you and however you wanna reach out to both of us, you can do so. So with that being said, I serve on house transportation. We usually typically have two big bills. One is the transportation bill. Uh, this is where we talk about really, really interesting things like which bridges we're gonna repair and uh, which culverts we're gonna repair and in what time order and uh, pretty much nobody really cares until um, their bridge or their road or their culvert is not repaired. So uh, if I don't hear from you, that's probably a sign that we're doing an okay job. Uh, there's actually a lot going on in our community right now. Um, every single time I drive around the rotary uh, at Route 7 and I, you know, you go through that split, I'm like, yep, that's, yeah. And I just, you know, uh, I go by the houses that their entire front yard is dug up and I thank everybody for your patience. In the long run, um, these improvements, both with regards to just a little bit south of there, uh, the improvements with regards to Vermont rail, so that we can actually have a rail line that like goes up north and down south, as well as right here in our community um, with the Rotary. I thank you for your patience. Uh, these transportation improvements are not without uh, significant inconvenience and frustration and cost and loudness, et cetera. Um, on the other hand, in the long run, ideally we should have greater transportation options uh, to go down to New York City via train or to Montreal. Uh, we should also be able to bike more safely. And as someone who honked and waved from that rotary in the middle there with TIFF, um, you know, maybe we, maybe we could all be a little safer in that particular intersection. So thank you for your patience. In terms of joint efforts uh, that Tiff and I have been working on, we submitted a bill last year with regards to how to capitalize upon federal uh, dollars pertaining to um, representing parents and children um, uh, when they are before the courts in terms of um, serving the parents, serving the children. Uh, it's referred to as a parent-child representation bill. Um, and we are hopeful that this will be taken up uh, this year, and I will definitely pass the torch back to Tiff to have her weigh on and 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 uh, add more color. Um, but I'm going to go and go through these quickly. We are also working on a bill because we've heard from a lot of constituents with regards to um, with regards to the makeup of the board of uh, the University of Vermont and how do we how do we bring. Um, this key institution of our state and our community um, to really connect to who we are and where we are at in this day and age. Um, and Tiff also mentioned uh, the ongoing conversations about waiting studies. And we've also heard from quite a few about um, PCBs in our schools. And that's an ongoing discussion as well, which we are paying attention to, but there are a number of different task forces that have reports coming out in the near term, um, particularly with the waiting study, I believe that report is due out December 15th, and then it comes to the legislature. Uh, with regards to the Vermont Climate Council, 
so in 2020, before Tiff and I were here, the legislature passed the Global Warming Solutions Act. This was uh, even without uh, the veto of Governor Scott. Uh, it calls for specific reductions in our greenhouse gas emissions in 2025, 2030, and 2050. Typically, when you look at where our greenhouse gas emissions come from, it's often broken up into a few different sectors. One of them is often referred to as our building or our thermal sector. So basically how we heat our, our buildings, our homes, and then also how we heat the water that we use for our buildings and homes. So that's like the thermal sector is what the term is. Another term is the transportation sector. I think you, you probably get that. Another term is the indus, industrial sector, which relates a little bit more to our large manufacturers uh, and some of the um, construction practices and uh, uh, processes that they go through to create whatever they're creating, if it's um, cement or if it's uh, you know unique computer infrastructure. Um, there's also agriculture and then there's waste uh, product. So basically, uh, the Vermont Climate Council is 23, I believe, counselors, maybe 24, um, of which 15 were legislatively appointed and eight were uh, are uh, administrative officials. Uh, so for example, the Secretary of Vermont Transportation, um, Secretary or of Agency of Natural Resources, et cetera. Uh, they voted out a climate action plan on Wednesday this morning, Wednesday morning, December 1st, so yesterday morning. And in that plan, they have a number of recommendations. Um, the, the recommendations vary depending on the time frame. Essentially, we, we are, we're, we're in a good place for 2025 uh, for how to, heat, how to meet those, those targets and those goals. Starting 2030 and then definitely into 2050, we definitely need to uh, invest a lot more in how we weatherize our homes, and we need to invest a lot more in how we shift to both driving with electricity and then heating our homes with electricity. And then, not surprisingly, we need to ensure that our electricity is provided by renewable resources. With today's available technologies, what that means today in 2021 is that right now the tools at hand are predominantly uh, various forms of heat pumps and weatherization for the building sector and um, either reducing how much, how much we drive um, called VMT, vehicle miles traveled, or shifting to electric tra trans electrified transportation or providing greater public transportation, um, of which there are many measures proposed in some bills that are being worked on for the committee that I serve on, as well as in the Energy and Technology Committee, as well as in the Senate Committee um, with regards to weatherization. So progress being made, um, depending on where you look, you know, for some people say it's, uh, it's too quick, we're not planned, we're not ready. For a lot of other people, um, the, the viewpoint is it's too slow. And uh, when we put our hearts and minds to something, we can do it. So uh, personally, I'll be proposing a couple of bills that really try to push in the transportation sector. sector and I'm also supporting as much as possible, um, whatever I can for the other climate related initiatives uh, in the House Energy and Transportation Committee. And lastly, from 2025 to 2050, there, there are a lot of pieces there that relate to land use and how we develop and um, Act 250 and you know where do we put development and how do we make it as strategic and thoughtful as possible. Uh, and all of this then relates to affordability, which gets right back to housing, which gets right back to TIF. So uh, with that, I'll pause and I'm happy to take questions or pass back to TIFF. Um, no need to pass back to me. Uh, that was 
<clears throat> Thanks for summarizing the Climate Caucus. I know it's late. I don't know if anybody has questions. I have one. Yes, we have a question. Hi. Hi. Thank you for your service. It's Claire Wool with the Burlington School Board. Um, with regards to the task force on the implementation of pupil weighted factors, I'm not sure if you um, are aware Burlington led the charge in um, creating a coalition with many districts throughout the state of Vermont. Um, we have been working on this for two years. Um, I am incredibly disappointed um, by uh, the task force um, in um, how they've conducted um, their proposals. Um, and we had a meeting today. I listened to testimony again on the 1st of December. Um, and this 150 page report done by UVM and Tammy Colby and Rutgers was so comprehensive and thorough um, that it is glaringly uh, apparent that if our state leaders uh, don't recognize the discrimination that's happening um, within this funding formula to improve it, um, I really look to your leadership uh, and call into question um, how we move forward. Uh, we today, this Winooski superintendent called out that discrimination in a formal press release. Um, and I think that's where Burlington will head as well. Um, and so the wealthier districts um, are not at the table because they don't wanna be affected by it. But uh, districts like ours uh, in um, cities and rural uh, communities are absolutely hurting. And like we have shared, there's no empirical evidence on why this weighted formula uh, exists. And it is impactful, um, especially as we in Burlington um, pay our fair share uh, based on the economies of our city. Um, and as we look to um, the state to really be role modeling and within the report, it gave concrete examples of how to um, review and improve um, the per pupil weighted. So I hope we have your support as a school district and as a state um, as, as that comes to the table um, after you know the last six months, but we've spent, our own educational dollars to uh, work with uh, lobbyists to be able to get this uh, coalition together. And it's been incredibly time consuming um, to draw upon this thorough report um, and, to, and to utilize that report to its best ability rather than have um, individuals come up with their own suggestions uh, on, on how best to approach it. So, it's incredibly important to the state as a whole that we do this right. You are representing Burlington so well, Claire. I, I am. Um, I have been following the the hearings, but there are um, gaps in my understanding. I I actually listened in on uh, yesterday's hearing um, chunks of it. Um, I. I found the letter that the superintendent Winooski um, wrote to be very compelling and really um, uh, <clears throat> uh, sounding a call that I think a lot of people are really are going to have to respond to. You know, I, I need to, to fully understand this latest kind of new formula um, that the committee has come up with. Um, <clears throat> I respect a lot of the people on that committee. I mean, I don't know everybody because um, we haven't been in the building, but I, I have great respect for a number of the people on the committee. I, I too am disappointed um, uh, from, from where I sit right now. And um, it's, it, I know for many of the representatives from Burlington, we are um, very committed to uh, fighting for this. And I, I, I don't really understand why we have not embraced <clears throat> the UVM report and saying, well, maybe we didn't ask UVM to ask the right questions is <laughs> just made my head hurt. So at any rate, thank you. thank you. Thanks for all your advocacy and Mike Fishers and, um, you know, many, many people in Burlington have been very active in this. So Thank you. No, I'll note that um, Councillor Paul came off mute. So I suspect perhaps huh. either that was accidental or she wants to say something. I'll just say that I, I have a child, current, uh, two children 
in the Burlington school district system currently. And so this is pretty close to home. I'll also say that serving on the transportation committee, we use categorical aid often and it, it has worked there. So I am not passing the buck by saying, um, I need to understand this more because I do. Uh, the, the fact that it has worked in other applications, um, I've been an advocate as longer than I've been a legislator. And as an advocate, I, I understand that, that uh, sometimes understanding differences of opinions can really make a difference in how you come out with your, your end result. And I say that because um, when I look at the calculation that Winooski did where they lose a million dollars, um, that, that, that is, is not okay. Uh, that is a real distinct difference. And so uh, all of this is to say, uh, clearly we're gonna have a report and I have been reaching out to at least two or three of the people who sit on that committee, a um, couple of senators and one of the reps, um, but we have a lot more work to do. Ultimately, whatever they recommend is gonna come to the state house and then it's gonna go to the committee of jurisdiction education. And then uh, it's gonna have a lot more testimony. And then there's gonna be a lot of discussion amongst the various representatives. But I have two kids who are, uh, you know, I'm, I, I chose to live here because of the diversity of Burlington. And that should not be a negative experience. That should be a positive experience. Thank you. I have a question. This is Michelle. Um, and actually, Karen, I'm hoping you'll chime in on this. Um, it's unrelated to anything we've discussed. What I'm thinking about is the over 600 new infections that were reported and um, uh, reported in, I saw it on Vermont paper. And I'm aware that there was um, at the council meeting last night a vote to uh, institute a mask mandate. I don't really understand the details of the mask mandate. So I was hoping Karen could uh, describe that for us in more detail. And also I would just like to hear from our legislators about the state, our runaway infection numbers and your thoughts on how we're going to contain the virus, especially in light of the new variant and uh, state administration that frankly doesn't seem to want to take any bold steps to mitigate. So Karen, do you want to respond? Sure, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, all right, I just wasn't sure. Um, so, uh, you know, due to the passage of, I think it's called state law one, <laughs> um, I'm not really sure, but I think it is, has the um, distinction of being state law one. Uh, the um, municipalities are allowed now to make their own mask mandates. It's unfortunate, I think, just as an editorial comment, it is unfortunate that we aren't doing this statewide so that Everyone knows what the you know what the mandate is, and also just simply to have uniformity um, and a level of consistency, and the fact that you know uh, it, it may take some municipalities more time than others. And in the meantime, we know that the um, uh, the numbers are rising in the state. Um, we know that the medical center is now. Uh, uh, it, delaying some kinds of surgery. Um, and that's a scary thought. Um, so the answer to your question, Michelle, is that beginning tomorrow, December 3rd, um, masks are required in all buildings open to the general public. Um, this does exclude office spaces that are not readily open to the public like a, an office of five employees who they're all together and they do not interact with the public. Um, now there are some exceptions. Um, bars, restaurants, um, and gyms 
are exempt from this rule if they verify that all patrons and their staff are fully vaccinated um, from COVID-19. So, you know, for, again, for spaces that are open to the public, masks are required by all, all staff, um, that includes kitchen staff, bartenders, retail staff. Um, and then with restaurants, that same, that same thing applies. However, if they would like, they can, they are exempt from this um, if they are asking for proof of vaccination, which is very similar to what um, a number of larger cities are doing for anyone who has traveled, for example, to New York or traveled to Washington. When you go into a restaurant, um, you are asked for an ID and proof of vaccination. And there are some, there are some restaurants in Burlington. I've been to one. There are that are already doing this. Um, and uh, I have heard from a couple of restaurants that just want clarification on that. I hope that that is as clear as it can be. There is one other thing, and that is there have been a few convenience stores that serve food and beverage, food and beverages who have also wanted this. And that's why we put in the final draft food and beverage establishments. So that can also include convenience stores if they so choose. Does that Great. make sense? Yeah, thank you, Karen. That's helpful. Sure. It's a big step. It is. I mean, you know, and the, the other thing also, just so everyone is aware, is that, um, you know, this is for the effective period is, is 30 days. Um, after 30 days, if we... Um, um, you know, if we, if it is a, as a county, we drop um, to the CDC's moderate transmission level for a period of 10 consecutive days, then um, we will, we will drop the mass mandate. Um, and the mandate can only go as long as um, Act 1, which is Saturday, April 30th, 2022. Let's, let's hope that we can we can, <laughs> let's hope that we can drop the mask mandate before then, but if not, it would, it would expire in sunset on April 30th. Okay, great, thanks. Um, Michelle, you, you asked um, for our perspective. I mean, I, <clears throat> it is, it, the legislature didn't need to spend $100,000 <clears> or 80 or whatever it was to bring us all together to um, pass a law that um, that wasn't necessary because the governor had that authority anyway, <clears throat> and I and 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 so the the governor basically kind of threw down you know a dare to the legislature. Fine, here's what I'll sign, <clears throat> and here's what I won't, and I won't sign anything beyond that. So. We were left with doing nothing uh, or, pa or passing something that we knew would be vetoed. Um, and I, you know, I I certainly didn't want to do that. Um, I I wanted I I I mean, my sister owns a bookstore, and she she you know um, has to monitor things so carefully, and it is so much easier if it is in fact legislative bodies that that take responsibility for setting those kinds of public health rules um, so that they are consistent and the, we don't put retailers in the position of, of um, trying to explain why this is important um, and absorbing um, uh, resistance. Um, you know, I think that the legislature is going to look at a range of options in the the um, Right as the session begins, um, there's been a lot of talk about tests to stay at schools um, so that we would avoid um, school closures or you know quarantines, um, contract tracing, beefing that up. Um, I don't know what Gabriella has to to add, but but I you know I I think it's no. I mean clearly I'm disappointed by the governor's response, especially given what the governor um, did before. And, um, <clears throat> and so I think that we, 
you know, we, we're trying to do what we can do um, through the power that we have um, to enhance public safety and keep kids in school and um, reduce the number of folks who are in our hospitals. Thanks, Yeah, and I'll, I'll add a couple of thoughts. Um, I, I've heard from constituents of different opinions here. Um, you know, some are very much in favor of mandates, mask mandates, requiring uh, vaccine passports, as they call them. Um, and others are very much like, when will we, when will we be done with this? Um, and I don't want this anymore. And uh, it's, it's very challenging to, uh, to answer everybody. And in fact, you can't in a way that is satisfying. Um, for me, with a child who cannot be vaccinated, she's four, it, there, there is no return to normalcy until everybody who can be vaccinated is vaccinated. And then we have this other entire sector of the populace who is uncertain whether or not to be vaccinated, including some of my friends. And it, it becomes a very awkward personal experience. Um, you know, I'm like, hi, how are you? And I start to hug them. And I, then I find out, you know, they haven't chosen to vaccinate because they're waiting to see if I've grown horns. And I have not. I have not. In fact, it has made people safer. It has stopped people from going into hospitals. And it has made our ICU beds be available to the people who really need them. And, uh, you know, I'm speaking very strongly because at some point, we need to recognize what is a um, individual choice and what is a choice for the public health good. So I was pretty disappointed, like, like Tiff, um, that the governor passed uh, the buck to the legislature. He could have done this just by himself. Um, and, and I also wonder, why do we have weekly, weekly press events on this if it's not a health emergency? I, I don't understand why there's a weekly 45 minutes to an hour on this topic if it's not an important issue. If it's an important issue, you take, you take a lead, you be a leader. And that's what I look for in leaders. And just like the Vermont Climate Council, they came out, we had so many counselors who spent so many hundreds and hundreds of hours of their volunteer time working on this for the last five to six months. And on Wednesday, as soon as they voted out the plan, the administration uh, put out a dissenting letter saying that the process wasn't right. And, you know, I'm, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised because the, the governor vetoed the Global Warming Solutions Act. And frankly, the governor is a, a, a good person. He's a good person. He's a good guy. I enjoy chatting with him, but I want a leader. And that's not what we're seeing. Thank you, Gabrielle. I appreciate your candor and um, your leadership. Thank you. All of you. Might get me in trouble. So. Okay. Um, so any, any questions for uh, Representative Seven or Bloomley or Councillor Paul? She's not with us. Okay, um, well, thank you all. The update was thorough and um, I appreciate uh, getting to see uh, the sort of the detail of the work you're doing. Um, appreciate you taking the time to share that with us tonight. Um, I think this concludes uh, the December meeting, and actually the last meeting of the year. I think we'll be back first Thursday of February uh, next year. Thank you all. Can I? Uh, good night. Oh, do you have something, oh, Karen? I, I just wanted just wanted to put in a little plug. 
um, special should... election December 7th next Tuesday. Um, you can vote in person, but if you prefer not to, you can mail in your ballots. Um, uh, we're bringing our child in at the end here. Um, I, I don't have one that still sits on my lap. Um, and uh, um, uh, just, just putting in an extra plug for that, as well as for the two ballot items, the net zero energy revenue bond and the infrastructure bond, hoping um, even in these trying times, hoping that people can vote yes. That's all, thanks. Thanks, Karen. I hope you don't have a city council related injury. <laughs> uh, no, no, a, a broken arm, but not due to city council. And I, you know, I, I want to say, um, Councillor Paul, I, um, <clears throat> the decorum at, at city council meetings has really been, I mean, the, the behavior has been really rough and it is going to, I, I, I'm not quite sure what we <clears throat> do about that. I know that Councillor Tracy has, you know, um, warned groups um, a couple of times. Um, but I am sorry that 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 you all have had to absorb all of that, um, because that is not civil discourse. And no, I would tend to agree with you there. It's um, in all the years that I've been doing this, we've had contentious issues but we've always managed to listen respectfully to each other and even when we don't agree. And uh, the last couple of months have been um, very difficult. I've never been, um, up until just now, had never been at council meetings where a council president had to warn people not to use profanity. Um, people just didn't. You know, they might have thought it, but they, did, but they didn't say it. And uh, it's become pretty hostile. I have had people who have told me that they will not speak during public forum. It's just too difficult. Um, and I've also, there are also our city councilors who have expressed concern when they are not in the majority of feeling tremendously attacked, um, which, you know, there are publicly elected officials do, you know, do accept a certain amount of that. It's sort of, part of the deal, but there are certain things that we shouldn't have to accept. But, um, but then we have places like the MPA where people can disagree, but they can dis disagree nicely. And uh, just to end this on, on that note, we have such an amazing steering committee who is still <laughs> sitting here at 823. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Ooh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Reps. Thank, Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Good everybody. Night. Good night. Thanks. Good night.